I'm in the series. Um, this is the last part in the series. Uh, we did it all through the fast, a series that we're simply entitling Tuned In uh, to the Voice of God. Uh, and so I, I don't know about you, but I've been, I have been refreshing myself in the Word on this subject uh, for the last uh, few weeks. This is part four, and so I'm, I, don't, I, I don't know. I'm not looking for um, any kind of uh, response necessarily. I just hope that you are, getting, you are getting as much out of this as I am in this series. Uh, praise God. So uh, last week we talked about this, and really uh, the theme all through the series is that God is a speaking God, uh, and He still is speaking God. Uh, and we mentioned that God is more passionate about being close to you and fellowshipping with you than actually you are in, of Him. Uh, God thinks about you more than you think about Him, like way more than you think about Him. Um, he's thinking about you all the time, and he wants to spend time with you. One of the, one of the reasons he created people, Adam and Eve, was that he could have fellowship with his children and speak to them and walk with them and talk with them in the cool of the day. And, and so you think about that. The creator of the universe is thinking about you and wanting to spend time with you. I don't know about you, about you but that's just that's a little sobering, isn't it? to think about the creator of the universe. David said it like this in Psalm 139, verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. So he's saying, when I consider the thoughts that you have about me personally, not just collectively as a group, but me personally, he goes on in verse 18, were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because I know that we people have a t- tendency to exaggerate, particularly if we're telling a, trying to tell an impactful story or get our point across. We might exaggerate the details in order to get that point across. It's kind of human nature. Uh, embellish, some people call it, uh, which is why some of you will look over at Taffy for confirmation <laughs> when I'm telling you a story which is hurtful, by the way. It does. It hurts. It really does. Um, it's like when that teenage girl told me one time when I was just a teenager. She was cute, and she says, you want to come over to my house? Nobody's home. I went over there, and ain't nobody home. It was hurtful, you know? It just was it was hurt sometimes, you know? But um, he's thinking about us all the time, and he says, listen, he, he says what he says. He says that he... His thoughts towards us outnumber the sands on the seashore. That's a lot. Like I, let me let me let me put it in scientific terms, (laughs) Uh, because I looked this up. Scientists tell us that there are about a billion, with a B, grains of sand in one cubic yard of beach. I love my wife. Like, I adore her. I talked to you a little bit about that that last week, right? And we've been married for 38 years. But can I tell you, in 38 years of marriage, as much as I think about her, I haven't thought, I couldn't even fill a shoebox full of sand, right? A billion, and that's how, the point is, that's how much your heavenly father thinks about you and wants to spend time with you. But there's some sad news to this because so many believers are under this uh, thinking. uh, There's a teaching out there that says that God no longer speaks directly to people. Uh, And they can put some time frames on it. Like we have his word. Uh, This is his his written word. It's, It's we have it. We can open it and read it. And since we now have this, this is Reading his word is the only way that God speaks to us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it's, it's a dynamic way and it's the most important way. But that God no longer speaks directly to people. He, he doesn't speak to your heart directly ever since, and they'll put a timing to it. Here's the timing. Ever since Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and was resurrected, and, 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 and was ascended up to his heavenly Father, he stopped speaking. The problem that that theology has is it doesn't line up with Scripture. You guys want to get into this a little bit? Let's look at uh, John, uh, St. John chapter 10. 
Jesus is speaking, beginning in verse number one. He says it like this, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. Jesus is the door. Uh, there is no other way to get to heaven, get to the Father, except through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But climbs up some other way, the same as a, as a thief and a robber. Uh, in my Bible, I have that underlined, the same as a thief and a robber. In other words, there, there are people who will tell you that Jesus is a way, but he is not the only way. Uh, there are many ways to God. Your truth will get you to God. Your truth. Uh, your culture will find its way to, to God. No, no, there is only one truth, and it is Jesus. He, it is him. Amen. Uh, verse 2, but he who enters by the door, again, Jesus, is the shepherd of the sheep. Uh, that's, that's him. Verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens, and watch this next phrase, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Here it is again. For they know his voice. Skip down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. Huh. So if there's any argument whatsoever about who the good shepherd is, you can put that to rest. He, he, he clears that up right here. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Let's stay right there, because I need to clear this up theologically. He's talking to Jews. Okay? Uh, you can read the rest of the text on your own, and you can find out very clearly he's talking to Jews. And he's talking about how they, the Jews, are the original chosen sheep. And how they, the Jews, the original sheep, should have recognized him as the good shepherd. Now, uh, I, don't, I don't have time to get into it, but if you read further on your own down in the text, some of those Jewish people who heard him talk, use this language, got so angry that they picked up stones and wanted to, were about to throw it, kill him. They wanted to kill him. Th that's how serious this, that's the language he's using here. So, theologically, let's find out who he's talking about. He's talking to Jews about Jews. But then he switches it up, and he begins talking about Gentiles and how they, the Gentiles, that's us, are going to also be invited into the sheepfold. I'm just right here. Let's look at it. Look at, look at, look at the next verse, verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, Gentiles. Very clear. No mistake. I, I, I know of no theologians who would argue that he's not talking about Gentiles. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And listen, they, they, the Gentiles, will hear my voice. And there will be one flock. It's a mixture of both Jew and Gentile and one shepherd over the flock. Amen. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. So if Jesus no longer speaks to people directly, since his death, resurrection, and ascension to the Father, why then did he make such a point to include Gentiles in the same class of sheep as the ones who hear his voice, especially since us Gentiles weren't invited into the sheephold until after the finished work of Jesus on the cross. There is only one explanation, and that is he is still a speaking God, and his sheep still hear his voice. Can you give the Lord an amen on that? Amen. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Let's talk about 
how we were created to hear from him. Well, we know Adam and Eve were created. They walked and talked with God uh, directly in the cool of the day. He created them with the ability to hear. And we know that we as people were created after the likeness and image of God, which includes the ability to communicate like God. Um, it's, it's, it's how he designed us. Well, pastor animals can also communicate. That's true. Um, to a degree, but they, they, they are, they cannot communicate like we can. They just can't, they can't do it. Uh, I, I was, I was, I was, I heard about this, uh, Discovery Channel documentary. Um, I don't know if it went on for more than, I think it was just one episode, but it was, it was, a, it documented this guy who sat in this room day after day after day for days uh, and, and with headphones on for hours, eight hours a day, listening to whale sounds so that he can study the communication patterns of whales. Think about that, like all day long. And the Discovery Channel interviewer leaned in and said, what's he saying? <laughs> and he said, he's lonely. <laughs> no, you're lonely, dude. <laughs> you need to get out of that room and go find yourself a girlfriend, okay? I'm just telling you, right? I'm in. So, so uh, okay, this, here's, here's a good experiment for you. How, how many people own a dog? You have a dog at home? Do this, okay? Go home uh, today and just go up to that dog and grab him by the ears and say, hello, baby boy, how you doing? You, I just got off on my Daniel fast 21 days. I'm done with my fast. But guess what, sweetheart? You are going on a 21-day fast. Yes, you are. No more meat and kibbles for you for 21 days. You're going to hate it. Oh, you're so stupid. You're so stupid. You're so stupid. And that dog will wag his tail and be so happy with the message that you are sending him. He'll be so happy with what you're telling him, right? Now, don't get mad at me, okay? I love dogs, okay? I, I'm a dog person. Um, so people ask me all the time. They're like, Pastor, are there going to be dogs in heaven? Oh, I don't know why not. Uh, there are, we know the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together. We know there are horses, obviously, in heaven because Jesus comes back riding on a white one, right? So we know they're, and they're talking about different animals and other animals, right? So I don't know why there wouldn't be dogs, especially if it brings us, if they bring us joy, right? Um, now, now, now that cat ain't going to happen. Sorry. I'm sorry, but it, it's just, it's not going to make it, okay? He's not going to make it. So, so, so here's the point. Don't, don't get me. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to show how we were created in the likeness and the image of God as speaking, communicating people to be able to communicate. So what is the greatest way that God has, let me say it like this. What's the greatest way to train our ears to hear God's voice? It's through his word, With, without a doubt, the greatest way. Now, there are some details, um, specific details, like uh, should I go to that? I got two colleges. They're both great schools. They both Christian colleges. Okay, whatever, all this you can. I just don't know. I just, I'm, I'm tied up. I don't know, right? He's, you're not going to open up to the book of Acts and find out if that's the right college or not. I, I don't know. Okay, but, but I tell you what, the greatest way to train your ear to hear from God is to, is to know and meditate on his word. Amen. To know and meditate on his word. And as you do that, you'll, you'll come across something, you'll need, you'll need a word from God, and boom, all of a sudden your mind will go to a scripture. And it'll, it'll, it'll be confirmation of what you need. That's not just words on a page, this, is, this book is alive. I, I said it's alive. Yeah. And it'll speak to you. Amen. God will speak to you as you, as you learn. Someone said one time, they, they said, people ask me sometimes, they say, Pastor, Pastor what's, what, what does God's voice sound like? It sounds like what he wrote. Right? Let, let me give you an illustration, okay? So uh, in third grade, uh, Mrs. Maxwell, my third grade teacher, uh, joined up with another school in New York. Uh, same age, third grade class in New York. And those students, each one of those students became a pen pal 
with one of us. Anybody here ever have a pen pal? Anybody? Some, some of you aren't old enough to even know what I'm talking about, right? You don't even know what a pen pal is, right? Uh, it's a, you mean a type pal? <laughs> no, it's a pen. So, so, so uh, pen pal. So, so I, my, I had a pen pal, okay? Uh, and we would write to each other once a week, write a letter once a week through the school year, right? Um, didn't know him, never saw him, never met him. Just we would write letters. We, we'd put, write the letter. Uh, we, we'd seal it up, put it in an envelope. We'd put a stamp on it and we'd mail it. Okay. Some of you in here, a stamp is something you put on a letter. Um, you don't hit submit, you put a stamp. Okay. Uh, so, so let me give you an illustration. Gary, um, you and I are pen pals. You live in New York. I'm here in California. Okay. Um, and so I'm, I'm writing my very first letter. So I sit down. Uh, it's at lunchtime, Mrs. Maxwell's class. And I write, hi, Gary, my name's Doug. Uh, I'm also in third grade. How are you? I'm doing good. I like school. Uh, just kidding. Ha, ha, ha. So I can't, I don't have time to write a lot now. I'm getting ready to eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, and milk. Talk to you later, Doug. Mail it. Stamp goes away. Next week. Hi, Gary. How was your week? We had testing all week. Do you like tests? I don't. Okay, math tests are my hardest. Well, got to go. Getting ready to eat my peanut butter and jelly and glass of milk. Every week, same thing. I, I say different things, but I also I always talk about and finish the letter with, I'm going to eat my peanut butter and jelly, my PB&J, and my glass of milk, and off it goes. Well, my mom... And dad, we're going on a trip across the country and we're going to actually stop in New York. So my mom thought, well, wouldn't it be a great idea if we met up with Gary? We went to his house. We got a chance to meet pen pals all year long for the third grade. Wouldn't that be awesome? So she, she finds out the number, was able to contact him, talks to Gary's mom. So, 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 so Gary and I, when the days come, we're going we're gonna to meet together. First time, we're going to see what each other looks like. We've never talked on the phone. It's all been through letters. We show up as a family. We're on vacation. Show up at Gary's house. Uh, we come in and we, Gary and I high five. How you doing? All this. And he says, come on in. It's time for lunch. Uh, we made your favorite. <laughs> we come into the kitchen. I, I sit down and there in front of me, they, they hand, they put PB and J in a glass of milk. And my mom is mortified. She grabs me and yanks me away from the table. And I say to Gary, dude, are you trying to kill me? I'm allergic to peanuts. What's Gary going to say? Are you sure you're the Doug from California? Who's my pen pal? Because your letters say that you like PB and J. But what I'm hearing come out of your mouth is different. So either I'm not the Doug that's been writing him letters or something's off and it needs to be reconciled. Let me give you another case in point, okay? You guys tracking with me? Someone comes up to me and says, Pastor Doug, I need you to pray with me because I met this guy. He is cute. He's hot. Uh, he doesn't like buns of cinnamon. He's got buns of steel. Like he is hot. Okay. And I need you to pray with me because he might be the one. And so I need a word from God to know if he is the guy I should spend the rest of my life with. And I say, great, love to pray with you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Does he love Jesus? In other words, is he saved? Hmm. Well, no, he's not saved yet, pastor. But I'm, I'm praying that, that, that he's going to get saved. You don't need to hear God's voice on that. You don't need a word from God on that. Why? 
Why? Because he already, he's already spoken to you about it. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So if what you're hearing is different than what you see and hear, you're not hearing God. What you're hearing is an imposter. Jesus said it like this in John 10. The same is a thief and a robber. We were going too hard today. I'm talking about, I'm talking about tuning in to, to hearing the voice of God. Um, have you ever noticed how... I got more to talk about that a little bit. Hold on a second. This isn't my note. It's not my note, so I got to pull this out. I got to pull the, the Bible app here for a second. Jesus, give me grace for my words. Follow me down the camera. With the camera, just follow me down a little bit. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14. You, you can turn to it. You don't have to turn to it. Let me, I can just read it. H have you ever had someone prophesy over you? Uh, you, let, me, let me just tell you what that means. God told me to tell you. And then they tell you what they believe God told them to say to you. Have you ever had someone prophesy over you? So when, God, when someone says, God told me to say this to you, they're, they're now stepping over into the area of prophecy. Okay. Have you ever had someone prophesy over you and it came across mean? Just, you walked away feeling like 900 pounds of homemade sin on a popsicle stick, <laughs> right? Uh, you walked away feeling full of guilt and shame. Well, you knew what they were saying was true, by the way. What they were saying was true. You got caught. But you didn't walk away with a resolve. You walked away with full of guilt and shame. Okay? So I want to make that distinction. All right. But they said they heard from God. And, and if they said they heard from God, well, apparently they must have because they said it. Or did they? Well, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, which prophecy is, is one of the gifts. Especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Did you see it? So if someone prophesies over you, thus says, the Lord, thus says the word of the Lord, and you walk away and you're not strengthened, encouraged, or, or comforted, you need to judge whether that's a word from God. Now, now sometimes you, you might say, I appreciate that. I thank you for that. Okay? And then you, and you go back and pray about it. Because just because someone says, I, God told me to tell you, doesn't mean it lines up with what he already said in his word. You, you tracking with me this morning. I, I don't know why I felt a need to, to share that with, with you, but I, I, I did, okay? Um, all right. Have you ever noticed that the messages from God aren't usually in long, detailed instructions? Um, and they're not typically big, in-your-face, loud commands. Uh, the messages that we get from God are usually in short sound bites. Come. Go. Stay. Turn. Wait. Right? Uh, sometimes, God will get our attention in loud ways. If you don't think so, just ask Jonah, okay, <laughs> when you get to heaven, <laughs> right? But most of the time, it's, it's in a still, small voice 
or in a whisper. Uh, but when we meditate on the word and we, we, and we know God's word, what we'll hear those whispers. We'll begin to train our ear to hear them. Uh, 1 Kings 19, let me tell you, let me set this up for you. Elijah, the great prophet, was discouraged. He was burnt out. And he ran and he, he's hiding in a cave. And it's in this cave of discouragement that he's, he's, he's stepped away from his calling for a period of time. He just, he's discouraged. He's in a, he's, he's maybe, a, maybe a little bit of depression set in, a little, you know, something like that. But he, anyway, this is the great prophet Elijah. And your Bible says in 1 Kings 19 that while he was in this cave, God gets his attention. But watch what happens. It says, and there came this mighty wind and rushed through the canyon on the outside of the cave uh, entrance. Uh, and, and, and Elijah can see it, but it says, but, but God was not in the wind. Now, doesn't mean God is never in the wind because he certainly was in the wind in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost uh, but when he came in through the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Next, it says, uh, a, a mighty earthquake shook the mountain and then the cave where Elijah was, okay? But it says, but God was not in the earthquake. Now, that doesn't mean God's never in it because God was certainly uh, in that when, he, when Paul and Silas were in that prison cell and God at midnight shook that, those prison doors wide open with the earthquake, okay? So, so it could happen. So, 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 so then it says, next, uh, there came a, a mighty fire that whipped through the canyon. I mean, he can probably see, look out the entrance to the cave and see smoke and fire and flames just, but it says, and God was not in the fire. Now that doesn't mean God's never in the fire because he was certainly in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they were in the fiery furnace. And oh, by the way, Elijah just experienced God in the fire on, on top of Mount Carmel when he, when he prayed and God sent fire down upon the altar and destroyed 450 prophets of Baal. So, so we know God could be in that, but, but each, on, in each step, he was not in, he, he wasn't in the earthquake. Uh, he, he, wasn't in, he, he wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the fire. Wasn't in earth, wind, or fire. Okay. But then watch what it says. After the fire came a gentle whisper. Whisper. And that whisper said, get up, Elijah. Get out of this cage of a discouragement because there is purpose for you to fulfill. Word, word from God. Word from God. Pastor Doug, why wouldn't we be more apt to step out in faith if God was more loud with his, with his voice, more obvious and loud? Why does God speak to us in whispers? Here's what I think. It's because you gotta be in close proximity to hear a whisper. That's right. Sometimes the messages from God that we get are less about the details and more about the experience of being in his presence. Okay, that's for somebody in here right now. That's for somebody, all right? Um, I told you I was going to tell you about a time when I heard the whisper of God. So our girls, um, and, and guys, you can guys come on up. Okay. I'm, I'm about done here. Our girls were very young. Uh, just, just, uh, if we had two, we have two daughters that were very, very young at the time. Um, I've been in the dairy industry for 40 years now, uh, serving in the dairy industry, working with dairy farmers. And, uh, and back then, I, I, was, I was at that point too, and my girls, like I say, were, were really young. My fa I had a young family. And a man approached me with a job opportunity. Uh, it was so far above what I was earning at the time that I, I had to look at it like triple check. Like, what? Like, you know, and he offered that to me, called me on the phone. Originally, I turned it down. It was at least three times my salary. Uh, the, the perks and the benefits were like crazy out there. Like it was just huge benefits. It would have, been, it would have set my family up um, for, for fin their financial future. I actually turned them down because we love, you know, we have family, our church family. I wasn't the senior pastor at the time. So, I mean, Pastor Hillary, I mean, you know, 
it wouldn't have, the church wouldn't have really, it wouldn't have impacted our church much because I wasn't, I was the associate. Not that, not that associates don't impact us. It's just, it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal for me to, to have stepped away at that time. And uh, I turned him down. So he, he, about two weeks later, he flew out again. He flew out to California, took me to lunch, and he sweetened the deal. He said, listen, if you, if you sign with us, he upped the salary, which is crazy to begin with, the perks, he says, and we'll, you and your family will be able to stay free at one of our homes. This was in Pennsylvania, along the Great Lake, private docks, boat docks, the whole bit. Beautiful, showed me pictures, beautiful. Like, wow, you gotta be kidding me. I, I had friends tell me, dude, you are crazy if you turn this down. Like, this is, this is God opening a door for you. Like, you need to jump through this and be grateful right? The problem was, is that I had nothing but anxiety about it. I didn't know if I should go. I, I needed, if, if I ever needed to hear the whisper of God, it was then. You know, there's a lot at stake. You got a young family, you know, there's a lot of, re- lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure. And I didn't know if the anxiety that I was experiencing was because I was supposed to go and I was being hesitant. So that was creating anxiety. Or was it the other way around? Was I not supposed to go and I was, I was maybe leaning in that direction so it was causing anxiety? I didn't know. I was like, I need a word from you. And so uh, I did what I talked to you guys about a couple few weeks ago. Um, I pulled up my prayer journal and I just began to write down my prayer request and what I was feeling in that moment. And I wrote down big letters, anxiety, anxiety. I wrote it down. And, uh, and I, I begin to say, God, I, I'm, I'm anxious about this because I'm, I'm, I need direction to know what to do. Specifically, I need you to speak to me. So I wrote that down, anxiety. And then my mind went to a scripture. It's Colossians chapter 3, uh, 15. And, and I know this verse, by the way. I, I, I know it, okay? Let, let, let the peace of God rule in your heart, you know, as you, uh, as you have been called in one body, be thankful. I, I know the verse, okay? I, I know it. I, I didn't have to turn to it because I, I, I memorized that verse. I know it. So I, I said, I, I wrote that verse down and I wrote it out. But then I thought, I need, to, I need to turn to my Bible and I need to look at it. I need to look at it in my Bible. So I turned to Colossians 3.15 in, in this Bible, by the way. This is not the Bible that I normally preach from. I haven't preached from this Bible in many years because I'm older now and the, the, and the print is very small. And so over the years, I've had, to, I've had to adjust to larger print Bibles, okay? So it's been probably 15 years or maybe 20 since I preached out of this particular Bible. But I was looking through it the other day. There's notes all the way through it. It's, it's, it's just great. I was reminded, wow, I remember when that happened. I remember when God taught me something here and I had all these notes. And I was just having fun kind of reminiscing through here. Uh, and one of the things I loved about this Bible, and this is the one that I opened up that day. And the reason why I'm sharing it with you is because uh, this is a parallel Bible. Uh, it's, it means it's a King James version on one side. Come on, how many King James fans do we got in here? Yeah! Okay, we got King James version on one side, and there was the Amplified version on the other side. So it was parallel, have both on one page. So I opened up Colossians 3.15. But this time, instead of looking at the King James side, I looked at the Amplified side. Had never read this before in the Amplified. And here's what it told me. It said, it said, let the peace of God rule in your heart, brackets, as an umpire. And I'd never read that before. So I, I wrote it down. As an umpire. Peace. So then I wrote this down. Peace equals ruled safe. Because I know what umpires do. They rule you, you're safe or out. Peace equals ruled safe. No peace equals ruled out. I looked at that and it was like, it was like the whisper of God rose up into my spirit. And I looked at those words, it's out. I have no peace. I've got no peace. An opportunity that should have been like a sure thing, like a no-brainer, they called it. Some of my friends were like, dude, you are cray-ray. 
you are not taking this opportunity where do i sign up but i had no peace and i heard the spirit of god tell me no peace it's out i turned him down again uh, went on six months later a friend of mine walks into my office with a copy of the wall street journal open to a section of the wall street journal that had that company's name in the title of the article and it said something like this in the name of the company all senior partners indicted by the department of justice for trade violations and it listed several of the partners including the guy who, who come told me to join up with him 48 million dollar liability case the, uh, immediately the, the, the company was disbanded another company came in and took over the holdings of the company the management team was 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 stripped apart and, and, and separated out and I looked at that and I just said God you are a speaking God and your sheep heard your voice and I'm so thankful for that church I just want you to know you are a sheep and you've been created with the ability to hear from God get your Samuel ears up and start listening to what he's telling you to do and God will speak to you amen come on amen did you receive it in that series? If you enjoyed this series, come on, let's give the Lord a big hand today for what he's done for us. Praise God. Yeah. Thank you, Father.